underwater navigation is both a science and an art form. Guys, in today's video, we're gonna be talking about how we combine several different navigation techniques to explore different dive sites and to make it safely back to the boat. Guys, my name's Jeff. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, definitely hit that subscribe button so that you never miss a dive because in each video, we try to explore a different dive site and talk about different aspects of scuba diving along the way. So in today's video, we're gonna be diving at a little frequented site called Truck Lagoon. It's out here on the west end of St. Croix and it's between two very popular sites, the shallow wrecks of Butler Bay and Armageddon. We've done videos on each of those, so make sure to check out those videos at the end of this one. But let's hop in the water, talk about navigation, and see if we can't make it safely back to the boat. Our dive begins at the stern of the wreck of the North Wind, a 75 foot long tug. It's a pretty prominent landmark and makes the perfect reference point for not only beginning our dive, but also ending it. When we talk about underwater navigation while scuba diving, it's often a focus on just one thing, like how to use a compass. But in practice, superior navigation is the combination of several things, including using a compass, natural navigation, and something called cognitive mapping. More on cognitive mapping in a minute. Let's first focus on our compass and defining what natural navigation is. Natural navigation is using our surroundings to find our way. This truck chassis is a perfect example of something we can use as a reference point on this dive. We'll be identifying several natural landmarks scattered in the sand that can assist us in navigating. Your job is to see if you can remember them and remember where we're at relative to them. Of course, the best way to begin our dive is to get our bearings by first taking a compass heading between our first two natural landmarks. In this case, we headed out at about 210 degrees to the southwest from the wreck of the north wind to the first couple of truck chassis. But in order to understand how we did this, let's first talk about the parts of a compass. Looking at the face of the compass, there is a red line down the center. This is called the lubber line. The lubber line is what we use to point in the direction we want to travel. Next, we're going to look at the side of the compass because we're not going to read the compass heading from the top. We read it from the heading window on the side. Another part of the compass is the bezel. This part rotates around the outside of the compass. If you rotate the bezel so that the two little tick marks indicating north on the bezel straddle north on the floating compass, it can help you keep your heading. Looking out across the sand, we find another patch reef with a truck chassis up on it. Taking another heading, we swim over. When crossing long distances, it's best not to get fixated on the compass. If you focus too heavily on the compass, you can begin to chase it, which can create a scenario where you're constantly swimming in a zigzagging pattern, or worse, permanently getting yourself off course. Rather glance at the compass at regular intervals to ensure your heading is correct, then look up to verify that your course over the sea floor is still in line with your intended destination. If you can't see your final destination because of low visibility, it's too far away, or a combination of both, then apply more natural navigation techniques to assist. Pick a spot a few yards or meters ahead of you that is in line with your compass heading and swim towards it. Almost anything works for this, from a small patch of seagrass to a larger coral head to a discoloration in the sand. Once you pass it, verify your heading again on your compass and pick another spot up ahead to navigate towards and repeat the process until you have your final destination in sight, then swim towards it. If there is a current, it can affect your navigation significantly and you may need to compensate for it, even if it is relatively weak. Although the strength of the current is important to note, for navigation, the direction of the current is the biggest concern. If the current is pushing directly behind you, it'll speed up your rate of travel. As a result, things happen faster. So if you're off course a little, you'll have less time to make a correction. 
if you're swimming directly into the current, it'll slow you down, which isn't particularly problematic. But what is problematic is when the current is on your side, which is often the case when swimming back towards shore with a longshore current present. In this case, you'll need to alter your heading slightly into the current to compensate for the current continuously pushing against you. This is called crabbing into the current. Pilots do this all the time to counter the effects of a crosswind when flying an airplane, and the goal is to maintain a straight course over ground to your destination. This again is achieved by altering your compass heading and swimming slightly into the current, and the stronger the current, the more you'll need to swim into it to keep a straight line to where you're going. If you don't, the current will continue to push you sideways and you'll miss your final destination even though your compass heading was continuously pointing in the right direction. Combining natural navigation with good compass work is a solid foundation for good navigation, but applying cognitive mapping can make it even better. But more on this in a second. We've now reached the turning point in our dive, which is at the edge of Armageddon in 65 feet or 20 meters of water, and it's time to turn back. So what is cognitive mapping? Cognitive mapping is accumulating spatial knowledge in order to visualize images and enhance recall. In short, it's creating a map of where you've been in your mind's eye to the point where you can visualize it and see it as if it's tangible and remember it so that you can trace it backwards to where you started. Like learning to use a compass, creating a cognitive map of the environment around you is a skill that needs to be developed and practiced over time. And it can only be achieved by being actively engaged in the world around you. As it applies to scuba diving, this means you'll need to train your brain to become acutely aware of everything you see, remembering where different navigational landmarks were located, where they are in relation to each other, and what direction you decided to go after reaching them. Alternatively, you can also bring a slate with you and create a physical map of the dive site as you go. Layering in cognitive mapping or creating a physical map of the dive site can be immensely powerful when navigating underwater, but relying solely on cognitive mapping or a physical map you've just created on your slate can lead to trouble as our internal instincts can sometimes lead us astray. Which is why we always apply cognitive mapping as a navigational technique in addition to using compass and applying natural navigation. Now many times you'll be with a local dive guide that will have an intimate knowledge of the area and will navigate for you. Hiring a local guide is always a good idea, particularly if you're diving somewhere you've never been before. But next time you're with that guide, challenge yourself to keep track of where you're going and how to get back. This will help you become a more aware and confident diver in a safe environment. At the end of the day, navigation is a skill that must be maintained and continuously refined. A navigation course will get you started, but it's up to you to apply what you've learned and continue to develop and maintain good navigational skills.